The number of coronavirus cases is still rising in Europe, but some countries are already easing their lockdowns. Is it too soon? And how can we deal with the risk of a second wave of infections? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Bernard Smith. Measures to stop the spread of coronavirus are affecting the lives of billions around the world. Shops are closed, public gatherings and travel are severely restricted. Europe accounts for half of the two million cases recorded worldwide. But some countries are easing their lockdowns, saying the rate of new infections appears to be stabilising. Health experts have warned that lifting the restrictions too soon may lead to a second wave of infections. The EU is urging its member states to carefully coordinate their plans. Germany has the fourth highest number of cases behind the US, Spain and Italy, but its death toll is much lower. Chancellor Angela Merkel says some small shops can reopen next week, but schools won't resume until early May, bars and restaurants will stay closed and large public events will be banned until August. What we've achieved is an intermediate success, no more and no less. And I emphasise that it is a fragile intermediate success. On the one hand, we said shops up to 800 square metres can open, but only with good hygiene precautions in place. And we have to make sure that there are no long queues on the street outside. That's part of the responsibility too, and will require a lot of preparation as well. Other European countries have started to gradually lift restrictions. Children in Denmark are returning to school and nurseries, while smaller shops are reopening in Austria. Shopping centres and hairdressers due to follow at the beginning of May. Italy has allowed some businesses to reopen, but lockdown measures remain in effect in the hard-hit northern regions. In Spain, a few non-essential workers in manufacturing and construction are able to return to work. In the Czech Republic, shops that sell building materials and bikes have reopened, and some social distancing rules have been relaxed. Let's introduce our panel. In Grindelwald, Switzerland, we have Annalise Wilder-Smith, a professor of emerging infectious diseases at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. In Singapore, Drew Thompson, a research fellow at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and a research scientist at CNA Corporation. And in New York, Wafa El Sadr, a professor of epidemiology and medicine at Columbia University. Welcome to you all. And can I start with you, uh, Professor, in New York? What do you think needs to be in place before you can begin to think about loosening lockdown restrictions? I believe that there needs to be um, a decision regarding loosening of any of these lockdown uh, measures should be anchored in evidence. It should be anchored in data that are available for each of the countries uh, and even better for each of the communities that we're talking about. For example, we know that there need, we need to have evidence that there's a decrease, a sustained decrease in the numbers of new infections. And by sustained, I mean not just for one day or two days or three days. Preferably, we need to see that the sustained decrease is for 10 or 14 days at a minimum. We need to see also a decrease in the numbers of deaths, and that also should be sustained. And we also need to make sure that we have the resources to be able to continue to test people, to identify cases rapidly, and to be able to contain and isolate those cases and their contacts. So the decision needs to be anchored in these metrics. And, uh, and then there has to be very careful thought given to what should be loosened uh, or eased first and what should be done second. And at the same time, as the easing of these restrictions is, is taking place, we should also be continuing to measure very carefully the metrics that I mentioned before so that we can rapidly determine if there's a resurgence in the numbers of cases and act accordingly. Annalise, are these some of the uh, calculations you would be making? I totally agree with her. Um, as we de-escalate some of the measures, we need to strengthen, we need to escalate, we need to build up other measures. And the measures that must be in place before we even think of lifting some of our lockdown measures 
in include the testing capabilities unless we are able to liberally test and identify new cases and quickly isolate them, we should not even be thinking about lifting. I also agree with uh, that one of the criteria for lifting is a consistent decline of, of new cases um, so that we can then start to gradually lift some of the measures, but also pull in the rain when we see that the cases increase again. Over. Drew, Singapore's reported a record 447 new cases, the third straight day of uh, sharp spikes. Did Singapore take their eye off the ball? Everybody in the rest of the world was sort of looking over to those Asian countries as examples to follow. Well, Singapore is a unique case because the majority of those, um, of those new infections over the past week have occurred in the migrant worker population, which are housed in massive dormitories comprising up to 20,000 workers in each, you know, lodged in rooms between 12 and 20 people per room. So it's a very densely packed uh, environment where the infections are spreading very rapidly. And the government's putting a lot of effort into trying to uh, uh, bend that curve by pulling out people when they're sick, massive testing, as uh, I think testing is, is key, as well as uh, isolating uh, patients when, when they're identified. But if I can go back to the last question, I'd add a couple of uh, a couple of other conditions that I think ought to get met. Ideally, a vaccine is available uh, when lifting occurs. The other thing I think that would be very helpful is uh, for, for decision makers would be large scale antibody testing, so that you can have a better sense of what the true spread is throughout the the country, not just the the testing of potential cases, but to determine who was infected already and maybe didn't present. Uh, any symptoms, because then I think decision makers have a much better chance of being able to determine and strike that balance between uh, the need to restart economies and the need to protect public health. And without good data on how many people were actually infected, and that can only, I think, be done retroactively because so many of the, the capacity of, of many countries to do testing at the outset was just limited, including in the United States. So I think antibody testing will provide valuable data for uh, governments to make decisions about letting people then go back into, into mixed society. The other question that I think really needs to be answered is whether or not having been previously infected gives you a degree of immunity. I think that's an open question at this point as well. Wafa, as we know from the United States, President Donald Trump is itching for some way of getting the economy going and of easing restrictions. We understand that one way might be to ease restrictions in, in areas with low coronavirus transmissions. You've got nine states with fewer than 100 cases, uh, plus a, a fewer than 100 uh, cases with just a dozen new infections every day. Is that a way ahead to allow some states to, re, uh, to ease up on restrictions before New York and California, for example? Well, uh, you are absolutely right. There's a, a certain itching to ease restrictions, and that's probably driven by concerns about economic, the economy and what's happening to the economy in the United States uh, now. Uh, as well as um, concern, a legitimate concern about, uh, you know, fatigue, the population fatigue uh, with uh, prolonged restrictions and uh, being imposed in, in many different areas. Uh, but I think we need to be very cautious because, uh, you know, I always say that epidemics don't know borders, and certainly they don't know borders between countries, but they certainly don't know borders and don't respect borders between states in one country. And the fear is that if you ease restrictions in one state, for example, that has not had a huge burden of, uh, of disease, uh, then that uh, does not mean that there won't be, at the same time, the potential for resurgence of, uh, of infections because of incoming of travel from other parts of the country. So it's similar to what uh, is being observed uh, in Singapore that was just mentioned. So I think that it, it is a risky strategy uh, to, to assume that by uh, easing the restrictions in one part of the country, that somehow this, this part is completely isolated from neighboring states where there could be a raging epidemic. And, and so I, it's a risk. In your... It's a gamble. Yeah, Go it's ahead, a risk sorry. and a gamble. Um, it's a risk and a gamble. And, uh, and again, uh, if that goes on, then it will be incredibly important to monitor uh, what's happening in those settings, not just through uh, counting of numbers of new cases, but also with uh, expansion of testing, as was mentioned. 
Annalise, pressures in Europe as well to get the economies re-going. And yes, we know the virus knows no borders, but different countries are doing different things. Is it too soon in Europe to, st I mean, uh, to start reopening even small businesses before everything's in place uh, for testing? So the capabilities to test are increasing by the day. And I, I, I do think we need to strike a balance between, between the negative impacts on the society, societal strife, mental health and economy and, and, this, uh, and this virus that, of which we know it will be with us for the next months and years until we have a vaccine. And we will not have a vaccine probably for the next 12 to 18 or even 24 months. So we need to live with this vaccine and we need to strike a balance that is reasonable and acceptable for, for communities. But we also need, governments need to be very wise and, and know, well, now we need to pull the rain again. Um, so what, what, I will, what I expect what will happen is that, you know, as is now seen in Europe, um, you know, every country is going through a different timing of the way of ways with now Scandinavia probably starting in the very near near future. Italy and 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 Spain is now basically almost over it, and and some countries have not been so affected like like Austria, and Austria already um, had only a few hundred deaths and and restarted to to open and lift lift some of their their measure, measures. And I think we all look towards um, Austria as well. Um, we just need to be, um, we know we are it's uncharted. Uh, we do not know which which of the many measures are is the most effective. You know, is it school closures? Maybe school closures, not that important, but clearly social distancing and any variation thereof needs to be implemented and needs to be continued over. So, Drew, for the moment then, do we stop having to ask when this will all end and just carry on living with it? Is that how it's going to be for the foreseeable? I think it's finally starting to sink in that we're not going to be able to go back to normal. Uh, there isn't just going to be a sudden lifting. I mean, at best, uh, there will be incremental lifting um, and, and stages. And as, as one of the uh, speakers just mentioned, that, uh, yeah, it's quite likely that there's going to be cycles and we'll be let out of lockdown and then have to go back into it at some point. So I think all of those different social distancing measures, uh, each country will have to determine based on its own risk tolerance and on its own social conditions, how does it want to change? I mean, one of the big questions will be, at what point do you start opening up your borders? Because many countries, particularly here in Asia, have closed their borders to outside travel. So that's going to be critical, particularly in places like Hong Kong and Singapore, China, where, where foreign trade and commerce is critical. It's not just a domestic economy that needs to be revived. Those domestic economies rely on international travel. So how, and, and tourism, for example, so how do you determine which countries do you open up your travel to? Which countries do you start allowing citizens to visit? How much risk do you accept from that? How much, you know, you can't realistically restart your tourism industry if you then insist on all tourists spending 14 days in quarantine once they arrive. So all of these measures have to be carefully considered um, and some, some risks are going to have to be taken and accepted. OK, I'd just like to tell our viewers about the criteria that the WHO has laid out. They've laid out six for countries to consider when lifting restrictions. And the first of those is how well the virus is under control, followed by the capability of the health system to, to detect, test, isolate, treat and trace every contact, while ensuring outbreak risks are minimised in vulnerable places like nursing homes, making sure workplaces, schools and other essential places have preventive measures in place, whether the risk of importing new cases can be managed, and finally, ensuring communities are fully engaged, educated and empowered to adjust to the new norms. Uh, Wafa, do you think in the United States they're ready to pay attention to those WHO guidelines? Do you get a sense that over there, they, that politically, they just want to lift the restrictions and carry on? Well, it really depends uh, who you're talking about. I mean, I, I'm here in New York City, for example, and uh, which is the epicenter of this uh, pandemic, actually the epicenter in the U.S. and probably the epicenter of the world uh, with regards to COVID-19 at present. And I think, for example, the mayor of New York City, the governor of New York State, they have been very, very measured in terms of the actions they have articulated, and uh, they certainly... 
uh, put a lot of weight to using data and, very, and data very similar to the ones you just and the metrics you just shared with the audience uh, that are uh, have been articulated by WHO in terms of how, when to make decisions and what kind of decisions to make. So it really depends at the local level. There's a lot of very careful thinking about what to do and when to do it. And, uh, and uh, in, in reality, in the US, a lot of the decisions about what to do next will happen at a local level rather than at a national level. Uh, so I'm heartened that I see again and again that uh, leaders here, many of them, uh, are at the local level, at the state level, are very much uh, coming to the experts to ask them for guidance in terms of what they should do next and what are the data they should be looking at next. And in many ways, it's going to depend on uh, balancing the benefits and the risks of every decision. And almost you need to almost make a list of uh, this is what we could do, and this would be the benefit and the risk of doing uh, whatever is being proposed, and, and make uh, those tough decisions and then be ready uh, to reverse those decisions if there are negative consequences that are uh, ascertained uh, quickly. Annalise, one option we often hear of talked about in Europe is, is flex extensions, flexible extensions of, of strengthening and reducing guidelines on social distancing and that sort. Can you explain to us how that would work and whether that's a realistic option? Well, it's a combination of, of a stepwise approach where you relax a few measures, but then if you if you when you as soon as you see a resurgence of cases, then then you reverse that. Um, and I, I think most countries will go for this because, to be honest, none of us really know which of the array of measures that we have and we can play with is the most successful. I mean, you know, school closures and university closures over a longer term has so much collateral damage, and we, you know, that, that you have to take this into account. Um, so, so, so clear, clearly, what we need to do is continue teleworking or, you know, safe at home where we can. And, and opening those 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 uh, workplaces where social distancing can be ensured, um, but keeping any um, uh, any situation where there's a lot of social intermixing, like restaurants, bars, entertainment, cinemas, movies, concerts, leave that to the very very end. Drew, when we talk about the need to increase testing dramatically, increase testing, what is it that we learn by knowing? What, the, what proportion of the population have been or are infected? Well, I think the issue for decision makers is, I mean, it's a, it's a dilemma that they face. Uh, if you open up too soon, then you get sick. If you lock down for too long, then you starve to death. So it's a Siberian dilemma, as they say. So how do you, how do you make that decision? And one of the ways is to determine how far has it already spread? Um, so you have a better sense of what true mortality rates are. Um, if you just look at the people who are sick and in hospitals, then your mortality rates are very high. But if you have a much better sense of the spread through the general population, then you can make a better judgment. You need that science so you can make a, a, a better decision. And it's terrible, but it's it's like it's like. Um, you know, it's like an insurance adjuster. They have to look and make very, very difficult decisions about about you know how much to charge somebody for their insurance. These are tough decisions for you know these are life and death decisions that politicians are going to have to make. So the more data they have, the better sense of of how bad the virus has already hit uh, a, a community or a society, uh, how bad the impact was. Then they can balance that public health impact against the economic impact. Uh, and the economic impact is, has been huge. And you know it's it's easy to say that we should close bars and restaurants and 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 social gathering points, but those are major employers. Um, and and that's a big social impact as well. So at some point, they're going to have to make a decision to accept risk. But that'll be a much better informed decision if they have a much better sense of what the extent of the spread is. But exactly, you still have to have the ability to to test. And you still have to have the ability to do contact tracing. And your healthcare system still has to have the ability to, and the capacity to manage flare ups. So all of those things have to be in place. But that decision to start easing up on, on the lockdown measures, on the social distancing measures, and take into account some of the, the most vulnerable people, whether that's 
vulnerable economically or vulnerable from a public health perspective, the more data, the better. Wafa, of course, it's much easier for smaller societies and countries to do widespread testing than it is for, some, than it is for somewhere as vast as the United States with its more federal structure. Is it as realistic to expect as much testing to be done in the US before you lift uh, lockdown restrictions? I think it is absolutely critical that there be massive expansion of testing. Uh, even today in the US, it is still difficult to get tested. And uh, even in a city like New York City, um, testing is recommended only for people who are sick and people who require hospitalization. So we know that we're not uh, testing people with mild disease, for example. Um, and that's a huge, uh, likely to be a huge proportion of the cases of COVID-19. So we absolutely must expand testing at all costs uh, in, in the U.S. as well. And I think, fo and do it uh, carefully and, uh, and focus on some of the data we have, for example. We know that in some communities there's a larger burden of disease, so we should go in there and do more extensive testing. We should look at vulnerable populations and go to those communities and do more extensive testing. So I think we can. We need to expand testing overall, but we need to also be smart in terms of targeting where we're doing uh, the testing. And I think at the same time, uh, as we're doing so, um, and as we're thinking of easing some of the restrictions, there's a need now more than ever to invest in public health. We need to invest in the people that are going to be able to go out there and test in the community, the people who are going to be able to track every case and make sure that it's isolated, that people who are isolated have food, they have the medical care they need. We need to make sure that we have enough uh, workers to be able to identify all the close contacts and make sure they're quarantined and they have what they need as well to be able to stay in quarantine. So I think this requires now an investment, a huge investment in public, in what we call the public health workforce. I mean, thus far, most of the attention has been paid and rightfully, uh, the attention has been largely focused on the healthcare system, meaning do we have enough hospital beds? Do we have enough ventilators? Do we have enough intensive care units? But as we move forward, I think we need to shift and think also, do we have enough public health workers who can do this tough work in the community to enhance the testing, the, the tracking and the tracing and the sustaining of isolation and quarantine for large numbers of cases and contacts? Annalise, are we all about to take part in one grand experiment to see what relaxations of restrictions we can get away with? It's, it's a large experiment. And, and, and I must also warn against head-to-head um, -head comparisons of countries. Countries are different in their societal structures, in their population densities. Um, countries will, will behave differently. Uh, but yet, still, we can learn a lot of the lessons. And I think we need to learn from the countries that have relaxed earlier and see what worked best for them. But my, my main message to you is, you know, the, the crux is you have to interrupt human to human transmission. And to do that, you have to identify the infected person. And for that, you need a test, but you also need the ability to truly isolate the infected person. And I must say, Asia has done better in this. If you look at, at China, but also South Korea and Singapore, even mild cases were truly isolated. They were not sent home. They were isolated in institution or in, in, in China, they called them uh, isolation shelters, fang, fang hospitals. Um, so as whereas in, in Europe, uh, all the mild cases are sent home, often without a test, and, and, and most times without a mask, at least in Europe. So there will be ongoing how, within household transmission as long we must stop, we must be better in isolation, in, in isolating infected persons. We also must be, get better in, in contact tracing. And my colleague from New York is totally right. In, the, in Western countries, unlike Asia, we've lost the capability to do true, intensive, extensive contact tracing. We do not have the workforce. We don't have the trained uh, workforce to do this. And we've now learned from South Korea how you can enhance this workforce or this skill of contact tracing with modern digital technologies and, and apps. And I, I think this is the future, and Europe is certainly now working towards uh, building up you know, better contact tracing uh, abilities. And that is the crux. I test, isolate, and contact trace. 
uh, we're out of time, unfortunately, but thank you very much to all our guests, to Annalise Wilder-Smith, to Drew Thompson and to Watha El Sada, and thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com, and for further discussion, go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Bernard Smith, and the entire team here in Doha, bye for now.